Thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, my talk tonight comes out of a lifelong connection to parks and other green spaces on this side of London. And over that time, my interest in them and their history has grown. And I've begun to look at how they came to survive the onslaught of London's development over the past couple of centuries. Um, and this talk, I hope, connects somewhat to Laurie's fascinating um, a presentation on uh, the Lee Valley in the last, uh, last talk, in highlighting the tensions that occurred over the uses of open spaces in urban environments. So please feel free to type any questions you have uh, as we go along. This is the story of ordinary Londoners and the part they played in the preservation of open spaces. It's not the story of elite campaigners in Parliament and the law courts, but the ways that ordinary Londoners have used their green spaces, the way that they've thought about them, and how they've helped to save them from development. The usual story told about the rescue of London open spaces starts with people like this, middle class campaigners. Um, from left to right here, we've got Octavia Hill, Sir Robert Hunter, and Canon Hardwick Rawnsley all of whom went on to found the National Trust in the 1890s. And the first two, Octavia Hill and Robert Hunter in the centre there, uh, were involved from the early 1860s in the preservation campaigns for London through organisations like the Commons Preservation Society. And it's accounts from them and others like them of the saving of common land uh, in and near London, which have historians drawn for their own histories. Much less is known is the story of ordinary Londoners and their part in the saving of London's open spaces. Uh, reasons for this may be because working class people have left very few written records. So what they thought and did always um, appears from somebody else's perspective. Um, the middle classes saw those below them in Victorian London as alternately comical or threatening. Um, and the reputation in East London in particular in the 19th century falls into the latter category. Writers described it like it was a foreign country that they were visiting. In books, articles and pamphlets, such as The Bitter Cry of Outcast London, published in 1885, East London was described as the sink into which the filthy and abominable from all parts of the country seemed to flow. So not very promising for East London there. But the reality was much more complicated. Some parts of East London, especially the inner East End, certainly did um, experience appalling conditions of poverty. Others like Hackney here in this slide, um, showing Conduit Place in the late 19th century, were much more mixed in terms of housing and income. Many working class Londoners in the mid-Victorian period began to earn more money and were able to um, move out of the inner city um, and come to places like Hackney. Many also were migrants from the countryside and they never lost their desire for connection to open spaces. Um, you can see here on the, uh, above the door of the first house, for example, um, caged birds, probably from Epping Forest, in fact, just up the road. And above uh, on the first floor windows are window boxes. Some others had small gardens like these behind Weaver's Cottages in Bethnal Green in the 1860s but these were soon swept away by housing development. So working men were buying or renting plots ever further east uh, in the suburbs of East London. And the reason they were doing this was, uh, was because of the growth of London. Up to the early 19th century, London's growth was slow. It was still small by 1800. And uh, Londoners of Shakespeare's time would probably still have recognized the city um, as it was at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, uh, in Shakespeare's London, there were about 200,000 people, which had doubled perhaps a little more by the end of the 17th century, shown in blue here. And by 1800, shown in mauve, London was still fairly confined, although the population had reached about a million. But then we saw extraordinary growth of London between 1800 and 1914, um, up to seven million by the eve for the First World War. And villages around London became towns and then suburbs as people moved out of the inner city or migrated in from the country to work in industries along the River Lee, 
and in other parts of the East End. Here's Bryant and May, a bigger employer, uh, who opened their factory at Bow in 1861. And the city became ever more crowded. And so many of the better off began to move out of London to live in villages which had easy connections to the centre. Um, William Morris's father, who lived in Walthamstow, commuted into the city for his job um, and lived, actually he didn't live in this house, the Morris family moved here after he died around 1848. Um, but this is fairly typical of an affluent um, upper middle class Londoner's village abode. By the 18th century, villages like Hackney had grown into sm desirable small towns on the fringes of London. Um, and Dr. Johnson was to say of Hackney, the greatest ambition of the London shopkeeper was to retire to Stratford or, and, or Hackney. And with a population of several thousand, Hackney had coffee houses, bowling greens, assembly rooms and taverns to offer its new inhabitants. But it wasn't only the middle classes who were moving out. Uh, working class Londoners also came to Hackney. They also wanted more space and, and moved to these expanding suburban, well, villages becoming towns. Here is Well Street at the end of the 19th century. And the sp suburban spread went further. The working classes of London were increasingly inspiring to own or rent property on the fringes of London. And here is Forest Gate. Um, and we can see here the edge of Wanstead Platts the southern border of Epping Forest. Um, and this picture illustrates the tension um, between open space and development. While the urchins sort of lark larking about in the pond in the foreground, behind them, uh, new terraces of houses are being run up at speed. Um, and this was not, this was happening all over London, this, not only in the east of the city. Um, here is Wandsworth Common towards the end of the 19th century. All the London commons were highly desirable open spaces. And as you can see here, many local newspapers advertise the charms of li living alongside them. That's Wandsworth. Here is Hackney in the, again, the late 19th century, the, the newspapers advertising handsome villages overlooking the Downs. And land on the edge of London was beginning to be put to multiple uses. Here is Morning Lane in Hackney in the early 19th century. Uh, Hackney had very pure water at that time, um, unbelievably, and it made it the watercress centre of London in the 19th century. And you can see the watercress beds on the right here, but also brick clay was sought after and many commons and other open spaces were increasingly being degraded by brickworks digging for clay and gravel. And you can see here brickworks on the left. And as this is a quote from Dickens, um, as he said, these places were neither of the town, town nor the country. Tumble down fences, places where the dusty nettles are growing, where a scrap or two of hedge may be seen. But despite all this, the open spaces of, of the edge of London were hugely popular with ordinary city dwellers. The commons were called London's lungs. And here is Hampstead Heath on a bank holiday Monday. Not only bank holidays, but uh, from the 1860s onwards, after the introduction of the Saturday half holiday on Sundays and what was called St Monday by Londoners, an unofficial extra day off for many of them. Visitors to all of London's open spaces came in their thousands and sometimes in their hundreds of thousands. To meet the growing demand for open space in East London, Victoria Park opened in the 1840s and it was very popular with Londoners from the start. But as you can see here, it was a highly regulated space with fences and park keepers to keep the humbler classes in order. The London Commons were attractive because they were not controlled, um, like Victoria Park. Epping Forest, for example, was just outside the Metropolitan Police District, um, and it was the centre of attraction for uh, many throughout the 19th century to come to events like the Fairlock Fair, an annual event every summer, which began in the, seven, in the 18th century when shipyard workers from Wapping came out to a party um, under the Fairlop Oak, which you can see in the background there. And it grew into a major annual event for East Londoners. Um, and you can see why. If you look on the, it, the, the uh, front left of this picture, you can see a, a kettle being boiled over an open fire. 
something which would be completely out of place and, un and not allowed in Victoria Park. Also, the Epping Hunt was a great attraction to Epping for, for Epping Forest. On Easter Monday each year, thousands of East Londoners attended, and it was almost like Derby Day for them. Um, and again, like the Fairlock Fair events, it continued right into the late 19th century. It was much satirised by London newspapers and cartoonists who ridiculed uh, Cockney attempts to ride hunting horses. The arrival of the railways made London's rural fringes much easier of access, and here's Hackney Station on the North London Railway, which was opened in 1870. And what the railways meant was that Londoners could begin to live beyond their uh, walking distance to work, so that they could, uh, so that the railways were used not just by professional classes to commute, but also working people, especially after the introduction of the cheap early morning trains. One, one arriving at Liverpool Street here. So it meant that East Londoners could consider uh, living on the fringes of London and commuting in just like their middle class peers. But open spaces were not just about leisure. They were also important to ordinary Londoners as meeting places where politics could be aired. And a great tradition throughout the 19th century in London was that of the open air protest meeting. And here is one of the most famous the Chartist demonstration of 1848 on Kennington Common. The Charter called for fairly mild reforms as we would consider them today. Votes for, well, men over the age of 21, the secret ballot, annual parliaments and so on. Um, and so, uh, but, so not in our terms very radical, but they were seen as hugely threatening by the authorities. And Chartist meetings were banned from pubs and um, indoor halls all over London. Because they were banned from indoor spaces, uh, the Chartists met in the open air. And here's a meeting at Whips Cross, Walthamstow, one of the first recorded political meetings on Epping Forest land, by no means the last. Um, I'm indebted to James Diamond's excellent People's History of Walthamstow for, um, for publishing this uh, this image originally. But open air uh, political meetings, as I say, frightened the authorities and made them more determined to control these open spaces. Uh, places like Kennington Common were turned into parks uh, mid century. Kennington Common became a park in 1854. Another great open air tradition was the election. Um, even though um, only a minority had the vote, non-electors were still recognized and courted by politicians who knew that they could have an impact at the hustings. These are open air meetings of electors and non-electors where before the introduction of the secret ballot, head counts were taken um, for the vote. So, and you can see the impossibility um, of counting uh, who had the vote and who did not um, in a situation like this one. This is a husting in Lambeth in 18 mid 1850s and often non-electors got counted into results. So whether it was for political protest or leisure, the open spaces in and around London were a constant attraction for all. Um, out outings in holiday vans were popular throughout the Victorian period and here's one leaving for Epping Forest um, in the 1850s. But just as working people could begin to enjoy open spaces in London, development began to endanger them, particularly from mid-century. Epping Forest became one focus of people's attention. Once a remote rural spot, as we've seen by the mid-19th century, um, it um, was really on the borders of London. And local landowners were beginning to see the opportunity to enclose the forest and sell it off the building land. Um, and many influential voices were raised uh, uh, in protest like Charles Dickens here in his magazine, Household Words in 1851, talking about the extension of the wilderness of bricks and mortar, meaning that we need to take more care of the wilderness beyond. But protests against uh, London Commons enclosures reached a peak uh, in the mid-Victorian period, the late 1860s, the early 1870s, and Epping Forest became symbolic of many of the issues. A much loved and heavily used open space the threat of building development hanging over it, 
and aristocratic land, landowners like this one, uh, Viscount Cowley, Lord of the Manor of Wanstead. Um, and people like Cowley became um, targets of increasing hostility throughout this period. This is a quote from Reynolds's newspaper, which is the most popular radical paper, huge, uh, hugely widely read by working class readership. And Reynolds's didn't pull its punches when it was describing people like Cowley. Um, oppressive, tyrannical, selfish, and rapacious. And whenever um, those words are used, a nobleman is certain to figure somewhere um, in, uh, in, the, in, in the story. Do remember um, to type any questions you have into the chat and I will try to answer them at the end. A word of explanation here um, is needed regarding what common land meant. The lords of the manor owned the soil of the commons though, and thought they had absolute property rights, but ordinary people uh, also considered that they had rights. They had rights to graze cattle on the common, to take firewood and, um, and other materials from the common, and increasingly they claimed they had the right to roam over these common lands. Um, and uh, so this is why local landowners became the target for so much hostility. And the dangers of losing London's open spaces continue to be highlighted in the press. And in the, uh, the key summer of 1871, this cartoon appeared in the popular weekly paper, Penny Illustrated newspaper. It shows a picnic party in Epping Forest um, being threatened as a woodsman fells a nearby tree labelled Rights of the People. Surveying scene, the background is the Lord of the Manor, and next to him a sign with Crown Lands spelled out on it in large letters, because in Epping Forest the Crown had rights of its own. Meanwhile, in the foreground, we see John Ball in his top hat, vainly trying to awaken uh, a policeman who's fast asleep. And the message about greedy landowners stealing the people's land while the law took no action, very clear. So 1871 was a high point for demonstrations against forest enclosures. A series of meetings took place across East London in the summer of 1871, culminating in a great demonstration on Wanstead Flats in July that year. And the gentlemen leaders of the demonstration turned up, made their speeches, appealed to the crowd not to take illegal action, and then they went home. Um, and later that evening, after the police had also departed, uh, the crowd attacked and broke down Cowley's enclosure fences. And this protest continued throughout the early 1870s uh, and spilled over into parliamentary uh, processes because po local politicians were beginning to realise that after the 1867 extension of the vote, popular opinion was playing a significant role um, in um, deciding the vote locally in local elections. So local politicians understood the importance of reaching out to the electorate in East London, many of whom had the vote for the first time. And this advertisement was placed in the East London Observer during the general election of January 1874 by the campaigning group, the Forest Fund. These two London constituencies, uh, Hackney and Tower Hamlets, were fiercely contested in the 1874 election by both radicals and conservatives. Um, and no candidate, either from the Liberal Party or the Conservatives, the key uh, parties taking part in the election, no candidate failed to claim credit for preserving open spaces around London, and especially um, Epping Forest. And here on the left is Henry Fawcett, the blind MP, who was a well-known open spaces campaigner who won one of the two Hackney seats um, very easily, while his um, counterpart in Tower Hamlets, um, the Liberal Acton Ayrton, who was a cabinet minister in Gladstone government and who was widely blamed for the threats that were hanging over Epping Forest for taking no action, was heavily defeated for the first time by a Conservative, the first Conservative to be, conservative to be elected in East London. Meanwhile, uh, the City of London Corporation had stepped in after the Wanstead Flats demonstration. They saw an opportunity to position themselves as the people's champions. It has to be said the City Corporation was not popular with most Londoners who saw them 
as a corrupt and undemocratic elite. So the City of London saw an opportunity to bring a legal case against the Lords of the Manor in Epping Forest to stop the fencing of forest land. The City of London was um, a commoner in Epping Forest because they bought Epping Forest land for their City of London cemetery. And so the legal case they were brought was as commoners to stop the Lords of the Manor um, enclosing large sections of the forest. The case dragged on for three years and eventually the judgment was handed down in 1874 by this man, Sir George Jessel. Um, and you can see it's a damning indictment of the Lords of the Manor. He said here, they've taken other people's property, appropriated it to their own use, made up false evidence, which must be wholly uh, discredited. And this at a time when rights of property were considered to be paramount. But we must see it in the context of the times. There was huge popular outrage for what was seen as stealing public rights. And this is what Jessel and the courts and parliament were, um, were answering to. After the 1874 judgment, the city of London can, be, began to buy up forest land from the lords of the manor um, and opening, reopening it to the public. And this culminated in 1874 with a historic act. I think it's hard to overstate the importance of the Epping Forest Act in 1878. It was the first declaration of a right for the public to use an open space for recreation and enjoyment. Um, and it says here that the Conservatives, the, uh, that's the uh, City of London, should at all times keep Epping Forest as an open space for the recreation and enjoyment of the public um, and resist all further enclosures, encroachments and building. And the campaign for Epping Forest has been called the beginning of the modern conservation movement in Britain. And it's hard to argue with that um, opinion. But other London commons at the same time were coming under similar pressure as Epping Forest. Um, in South London on Wandsworth Common, railway companies had cut up the common in the 1860s um, uh, by laying lines and selling off surplus land to local builders. Um, and it evoked another campaign there. And as you can see, um, direct action was uh, advocated from the start, right at the bottom the, um, the slogan, down with the fences. And, and this campaign was asking people, will you allow bankrupt and speculating builders, um, land societies, beer shopkeepers, rail companies, tailors, um, and noble lords to rob you and your children of their common rights and pass without giving up, without a struggle? Um, and the answer was no, they would not. And the struggle continued on Wandsworth Common until that was uh, turned into a, a public space uh, by an Act of Parliament in the late 1870s. Meanwhile, across South London in Plumstead, uh, people were fighting their own battle for the common. Um, here is Plumstead Common towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, you can see housing lapping up right up to the edge of the open space. And uh, people were, uh, uh, beginning to feel their common open space was being threatened by development. And this man, John de Morgan, stepped into the fray at this point. He's a forgotten figure now, but John de Morgan in the 1870s was probably one of the leading radical politicians of his day. Um, he never uh, um, served in Parliament, um, but he was a, a leading advocate of direct action uh, over open spaces. He was the founder of the Commons Protection League, which is a more militant alternative to the res respectable Commons Preservation Society, which the gentlemen campaigners were members of. The dispute in Plumstead was over the right of the Lord of the Manor, in this case, uh, an Oxford College, to sell off the Commons of various parties, including local businessmen and the army. Um, and despite a legal judgment against enclosures of the common in 1871, um, uh, enclosures by local builders continued. And in 1876, John de Morgan called for action. Um, and the result was three days of demonstrations and fence breaking in July of 1876. Sadly, this is the only photo we have of a commons demonstration in the 19th century. It's not a very clear one. Um, 
but it does show the occupation of the hillside of Plumstead Common um, by the protesters. On the third day of the riot, the Riot Act was read, troops were put on standby, uh, De Morgan was arrested along with others, he was sent to prison for a month, um, but released early owing to public pressure uh, to great rejoicing. And Plumstead Common eventually was, um, by Act of Parliament, uh, made a public open space in the late 1870s. De Morgan also turned his attention to Hackney, where he confronted this man, the local lord of the manor, um, William Tyson Amherst, first Baron Amherst of Hackney. Amherst's aim as the lord of the manor was to maximise the value from what he considered to he be his property. And so Hackney Downs was one of his targets. Um, and his agents um, enclosed, fenced off much of, the, of Hackney Downs for uh, gravel digging. But gravel was very lucrative um, because it was highly in demand for building and road repairs at the time. Um, pits and fencing began to cover Hackney Downs and the Hackney Gazette declared Downs are in the hands of the spoiler. We don't have a contemporary image of the gravel pits on Hackney Downs, um, uh, but this is Wanstead Flats about 1900, uh, um, at the end of a period when the flats had been dug over by um, a brickworks and gravel pits. And you can see how damaging, how degrading that was. So we can imagine that Hackney Downs was in a similar condition. Uh, De Morgan's uh, protest, um, the Commons Protection League stepped in to organise meeting on Hackney Downs um, and um, the newspapers covered two meetings. Here the top uh, meeting was, the, the top uh, article refers to a meeting where fences were demolished and burned, um, uh, the fences that were put up to, to protect the gravel pits. Um, the newspapers described this as a riot, um, but they also referred in the lower article to Amherst's encroachment on Hackney Downs. So the newspapers were playing both sides of the line really. They didn't approve of riotous demonstrators, but they also did not approve of Amherst's actions. But Amherst was not the only um, or, uh, person interested in Hackney Downs. Um, also the, the grocer's company also claimed rights over the Downs and erected fencing um, in 1877 over part of the Downs near their school buildings here. And so in June of that year, De Morgan let it, led a crowd into the uh, grocer's company enclosure and symbolically destroyed a notice board warning against trespassing. The struggles over Hackney Downs continued but, and were finally resolved um, in the early 1880s when uh, um, Tyson Amherst sold his manorial rights um, to the Metropolitan Board of Works, which is one of the precursors of the London County Council. Um, and the uh, Downs were opened as a public park in 1884. So the Downs were saved, but many were disappointed like, uh, that like other London's uh, commons, they'd been, as the Victorians would have said, parkified with gravel paths and fences. So respectability had set in. The struggles over open spaces continued to flare up everywhere um, in London, uh, including Hackney, and in the 1880s, a long battle was fought over Clapton Pond for, to prevent it being filled in and built on. And in the autumn of 1896, um, this, I particularly like this one, the Golf Club War broke out um, in uh, Honor Oak, which is on the borders of Camberwell and Lewisham. Um, one Tree Hill in Honor Oak was enclosed by a golf club, club um, and this led to protest and two huge demonstrations. At the first um, protest, a groundsman's house was attacked. Um, he was unpopular because he'd set to, uh, his dogs on boys that had been trespassing on the golf course. At the second demonstration, it was estimated that 50,000 were present. This might, may be an exaggeration. And 500 police um, were also there. The crowd stoned, stoned the police. They set fire to gorse on the hill. The hill was soon covered by a disorderly multitude, said the local press. Um, but again, a long struggle ended successfully because the London County Council uh, um, made a, a compulsory purchase order in 1904. And this is still an open space today with great views across London. Um, 
and the golf club still has little space on, on our oak on One Tree Hill. London's green spaces continue to be a destination for uh, Londoners' entertainment right through into the 20th century. We can see the popularity of cycling here um, in the early 1900s. And this is Epping Forest, the Robin Hood pub um, on, on the Epping Road, great meeting place. Um, and you can see here also in the middle, um, a wagon and horses bringing out um, uh, a party from London for a day out in the country. London Transport and the railway companies in the interwar years promoted rambles in the forest and other London open spaces. And I've included this because these signs at Epping Forest access points have recently been installed, but they're based on a poster design from the 1930s by the local East London artist and teacher, Walter Spradbury. Um, he said he felt himself lucky to be able to produce work portraying the joys of the open air. By the late 1930s, London's open spaces were under pressure again. First of all, they were pressed into service for air raids like this one um, on, on Hackney Downs, an uh, air raid shelter being built in 1938. And into the war years, as huge damage was done across London by bombing, especially in the East End, and thousands were made homeless. Um, this is Cundy Street in uh, Silvertown near the docks. Uh, there was a housing crisis in London. Incidentally, I, I like the idea that after all the destruction here in Cundy Street, the ARP warden is guarding the wardrobe, the chest of drawers standing, the only thing left from those houses, presumably. Some uh, of those bombed out um, in the East End were rehoused in accommodation built on Epping Forest, such as these prefabs built by East Ham Council on Wanstead Flats in 1944. The housing shortage continued after the war and East and West Ham councils both had plans to build uh, new towns on forest land. Wasted Flats was their favoured spot and this caused a huge local uproar. And you can see from this cartoon from a local newspaper what the mood was. The councils were accused of acting like the Nazis, which in 1946 uh, was a huge accusation. This cartoon is labelled Invasion 1946, showing building on Epic on Forest land. So a local campaign was organised and collected about 60,000 signatures when it went um, nationwide um, on a petition uh, which was uh, gathered through publicity like this, Hands Off the Forest. This, this um, uh, leaflet is interesting because it harks back to the uh, campaigns of the 1870s. Um, and it talks about uh, the fact that, um, that the, the urban planners were talking, were um, looking at, gri at a green belt round London, uh, which is completely at odds with the uh, policy of East Town Council and West Ham. The decision on whether to build the new town went to a public inquiry held at Stratford Town Hall, and the proposal was at, at length rejected by the ministry on the grounds that insufficient building materials were available um, to build the new town. And this sounds a bit like a fig leaf from a Labour government uh, to protect two Labour councils, but also because um, much bigger schemes like the Abercrombie plan um, for Greater London, which Laurie talked about last time, was earmarking new towns like Harlow for development for housing East Londoners. And the open spaces protests have continued. Um, here is the 1990s M11 link protest at Wanstead, and I'm sure some people listening to this tonight will remember this campaign. Um, and it focused um, um, at one point around the removal of a tree on George Green in Wanstead, uh, which is uh, um, an open, a common open space. Um, and it attracted the attention of the national media when the protesters uh, registered this tree as a residential address. And the uh, national press took great delight in taking photographs of postmen delivering mail to the tree. And um, activity peaked in the mid 1990s with several high profile protesters setting up independent states um, in property scheduled for demolition, notably in Claremont Road in Leighton. And although the road was eventually built in, and opened in 1999, the costs of policing protesters 
and the raising the profile of campaigns like this in the UK did seem to have contribute to, to contributed to a slowing down of, uh, of uh, the enthusiasm for road schemes. So I'll leave you um, at the end of this talk with this view of Hackney Downs and um, a quotation from a radical MP, uh, Francis Atwood, um, who spoke in Parliament in 1834. And I hope this story tonight has indicated um, the continuity of the need to heed um, Francis Atwood's words. He said, by the ancient laws, the people of this country had the right of wandering through the green fields at leisure. I wish those old laws were restored, for we cannot be too cautious in our interference with the amusements and enjoyments of the people. And I've put this on the background of that wonderful wildflower meadow on Hackney Downs. If anybody wants to read any more um, of this story, uh, my book, um, Saving the People's Forest, is being published by the University of Hertfordshire Press in a couple of months' time. And with that, I'll say thank you and close my presentation, but I'll come back in a few moments to answer any questions. You know about Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Lloyd, although we may have something new to tell you, but a new book from the Hackney Society and Hackney History tells a story of women you may not know covering five centuries and 113 women who either lived or worked, were born or were buried in today's borough. From the 16th century, the queens and courtiers, the blackmailers and laundresses who lived in Hackney's grand houses, to the radical artists of a century ago. Women who squatted its streets and documented its working life. They chart the changes for women and for Hackney. Hackney takes pride in its radicals, from the civil war, from the entrepreneurs who changed the look of our domestic lives, and from its performers. Hackney is renowned for its music hall artists, but its women also ran theatres and were the producers, writers, and designers behind some of Britain's greatest films and pioneered the high street cinema. Hackney was home to the earliest female poets and composers and writers from the first domestic goddess to bohemian radicals. This book delves behind our institutions to tell the stories of the women they house and of those who broke through into sports, into science and into other fields that had always been closed to women. Good evening everyone, good evening. Um, I'm Ray Blackburn, I'm from the Hackney Society. Um, I'm here with Mark, and in a minute or two, we'll, uh, well, I'll be asking Mark to uh, try and answer any questions you might be sending in. Uh, just, uh, just to begin, um, if there's anybody um, viewing the talk um, that doesn't know anything about the Hackney Society, um, just let me say a line or two about it. Hackney Society is concerned with the built environment in Hackney. We're um, we're concerned with protecting what's good about the old environment and uh, influencing good design in the new. And we try and engage people across Hackney with a series of, uh, of activities in this. Um, we have a series of events of which this is one. Um, we have a publications program where we have a quarterly newsletter spaces and um, a series of books which are published. And we have a, um, an active part in Hackney Council's planning process. Now, on the subject of books, uh, you might have just seen the rolling ad. We have a book which is about to be published this next week. It's called Women from Hackney's History. It's an, um, a production um, of women from Hackney, and it's about uh, more than 100 women from, uh, with connections to Hackney's history. Uh, they've all got interesting tales to tell, some of which uh, you may have heard of and some of which you will not. You can pre-order now and the cost is £10. That's a special price plus postage and packing. Uh, the book will be available from next week. Uh, you'll get more information about the book um, after, the, after the, 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 the session with Mark. Now the next event in our series of events, just one more thing about the Hackney Society. It's on the 25th of March, the 25th of this month. Um, it's uh, a talk 
uh, by two of the um, two of the writers of our new book, um, Susan Doe, Lucy Madison. They'll be taking us on a virtual walk, um, which we've called um, "Walking in the Footsteps of Women from Hackney's History." Um, they'll be taking uh, one or two of the women from the book, telling their stories, and we'll be visiting some of the sites which are linked to the women in question. Um, you can register for the for the talk now. There's no cost for that, and uh, it will be on the 25th of March. So, um, moving on from the Hackney Society, on to Mark Gorman, and I want to say um, a thank you to Mark for his stirring talk. I think the, 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 the main lesson I took from it was to, um, to say that we've always got to be um, alert to any, um, any, any, any threats to our open space and green spaces because uh, they may not be going away. Um, it was a good tale of people being active in, um, in resisting the loss of green space in the past. Um, Mark um, is a um, a local East, uh, North and East London boy. He's born, born and raised in North London. Uh, he studied history at university, trained as a teacher and ended up teaching in West Africa. And he's been active for most of his professional life in international aid. Um, he lives just on the fringe of Epping Forest um, and his twin interests in history and the environment have led him to study the, um, the history of popular protests and open spaces across London. And uh, as he mentioned, his new book, um, Saving the People's Forest, is due to be published, uh, we hope, during May. So it will, be, it will be available very soon. And we'll send you details about that after the talk. Um, now, let's see if we've got some questions coming in. You okay to go with questions, Mark? Yep. Okay. Now, the first thing I have is more of a comment than a question, um, but let's see if we've got any views on that. I've got a comment from Jane Hill, which was about um, backlands in London. And she's seen something in the Camden New Journal recently about backlands in Highgate, which um, they claim to be some of the last remaining backlands, but of course, under threat of being sold off and developed. Um, permission for seven houses was given last year, apparently, in Highgate. Um, are you familiar with this with this phenomenon, Mark? And do you know do you know any more examples? Um, I well, I know about that Highgate example, but I, I actually, yeah, I I don't know of others. I think one of the one of the issues with the these kinds of developments is that is that because the spaces that they are targeting are often quite fragmented and fragmentary. Um, it makes it more difficult, but more difficult, in fact, in, in some ways to defend them. I mean, organisations like the Open Spaces Society, which is what is the, the, the modern name of the Commons Preservation Society, do you know, really good work on the very detailed legal um, uh, actions that need to be taken to uh, defend open spaces. But it takes it's it's. It takes a lot of effort and money, of course, and many of the, these spaces, as I say, are are quite small and and isolated. Um, I don't know actually of any others, but um, it's uh, if if people do, then I would encourage them actually to get in touch with the Open Spaces Society because they may well be able to sort of be of help. Thanks, Mark. That's a good tip. So the Open Spaces Society is who to contact if you know of any spaces like this. Yeah. Okay. Now, the next question, this is from Nick P. Um, to what extent campaigns in the run-up to the 2012 Olympics, challenging the building on open land and its legacy, uh, are an example of this type of public action reasonably uh, uh, contemporary? Yeah, um, it, it was, it, uh, there, were, there were a number of different campaigns. There was, there were, several campaigns around the Olympic site itself. Um, there's also actually one on Wanstead Flats because the, um, the Metropolitan Police wanted to build a briefing center for the Olympics and sort of assembly center. And they thought um, an open space uh, a mile and a half from the Olympic Park would be ideal. 
um, and that nobody would really be too concerned about it. Um, how wrong they were. Um, it went to, um, it, in fact, it went to the House of Lords in the end, and the Epping Forest Act, Act had to be amended um, in order to allow the briefing centre to be built. But on the on the Olympic Park itself, um, I I know of well, so there were certainly several several campaigns, and um, it's interesting that that when when a sort of three you know, national interests are are involved. Then, as uh, as they were with the Olympics and as they were during the war, um, that um, that so protests tend to get um, steamrolled out of the way. Um, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't happen because I, you know, I think it's a continual reminder to authority that actually um, these spaces are precious to people. Um, and that they do have, you know, a right to a say in what happens to them, even if they are not the owners of the land. Thank you, Mark. Um, from Jan Fusco, you mentioned that the Lords believed that they owned the soil in, on common land, so it was their right to enclose it. Was this correct? If not, how was enclosure allowed? Wasn't common land stolen from the people? <laughs> well, that's what the Victor, that's what the campaigners said. Uh, they said that the the um, the theft took place during the Norman Conquest, when William the Conqueror handed out land to his um, to his cohorts. Um, the 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 issue over common land is is incredibly complex. And yes, the the Lords of the Manor owned the soil, but what they did not own was the right to enclose the soil because other people had rights too. So commoners had right, they had rights to, as I said, to graze cattle, take firewood, um, and increasingly said they had the right to um, say to leisure activities. So um, the, the legal case, the city of London brought, all turned around the fact that, that they, they said, if we had cattle in Epping Forest, they could not roam across the whole forest because of the fences. So although you, the Lords of the Manor, own the land, you do not own the right to, uh, you, do, you don't have the right to prevent us from using land. So um, it's, and I, in fact, I've come across, um, this still exists actually, there are still, they, these sorts of battles still go on, on commons across the country, so, you know, um, landowners, Landowners saying we own the land, and um, and local users say, but you don't own the right to access the land, and that's the that's the issue. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think the the argument that enclosing enclosure fences effectively stole land from people is quite a, a persuasive one, and in fact, that's what the law court said. Um, you know, so it couldn't have been that radical because the Court of Chancery agreed with that. The view in 1874, um, and they and it was a swinging attack. It, it really, it's it's an extraordinary judgment because um, the the one that that um, Jessel handed down. Jessel had been a lawyer defending um, Lords of the Manor in earlier cases, um, and it was thought that he would favour them. But um, but I think the weight of public opinion was so great that actually um, he felt compelled actually to give a a very, very clear um, judgment against the Lords of the Manor of Epping Forest. So fair to say that the people had right and the law on their side? Yes, yeah, okay. yes. Well, that's, that's, that's what they decided. Of course, the Lords of the Manor said, well, these are all ancient rights and they're, they're irrelevant now. Um, to which, of course, the campaigners said, well, in that case, so are your rights. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, and in fact, um, uh, Amherst in, in Hackney, um, uh, was completely nonplussed by the idea that, as he called them, foreigners from from Tower Hamlets are coming in um, to to use our commons, and it, it was this idea of lo you know local um, rights. I have the local right as the Lord of the Manor to do what I like, um, and that was what was challenged and undermined. Um, and then in the end, of course, um, th and that's why the Epping Forest. Um, struggle is seen as 
um, it was Oliver Rackham, a great um, environmental historian, who said this is effectively the beginning of the British environmental movement. Right, thank you. Um, two, um, two fairly specific questions from David Pollock. Uh, first is, is there any substantial local area of brick earth left that was not used for the 19th century expansion or explosion of London? Mm, probably not. I mean, brick fields were absolutely everywhere. Um, I've, I've just been doing some work on brick fields around in, in this part of London and in Stratford, uh, Ilford, Walthamstow. And they were, you look at an Ordnance Survey map from the late 19th century, they're dotty with brick fields and they were appalling places. I mean, uh, quite apart from the dreadful working conditions, um, uh, they were th they were in incredibly um, polluting, um, and of course they stripped away um, uh, many meters of of topsoil, brick earth, clay, and sand, and then just left. You know, once the once the brick earth was worked out, the um, the brickmakers moved on. Um, and there's a sort of romantic idea that many of the brickmakers were sort of, you know, small independent craftsmen. Some were, but many of the brick fields were actually ultimately owned by quite substantial proprietors. Um, and as I say, they um, they they countenance working conditions, which were absolutely even even in the 19th century, people were uh, were appalled by um, the condition. So short answer is I don't I. If there was brick earth to be had, um, a brick field would appear. Okay. Um, next question from David. What year was that early Chartist meeting at Whips Cross? Oh, um, I think it was eighteen. I think it was actually eighteen. From memory, it was eighteen thirty-nine. Um, it was some years before the Great Kennington Common demonstration. Um, but that's from memory, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's the late 1830s. Okay, thank you. I think um, it's referred to, I, d I did mention James Diamond's book on uh, Walthamstow, the People's History of Walthamstow, but, um, I th and it's in there, so the date will be there. So that's the place to check. Mm. Okay. Um, next next is, uh, it's not, not a question, but a, but a comment on, on the talk, and I'll read it out. Um, not a question, but a statement, a brilliantly paced, well-evidenced and thoroughly researched people's narrative, an excellent exposition. Thank you, Mark. And that's from oh. Lower Clapton. So. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Lower Clapton. I always said it was a great area. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now then. Um, Sean Gubbins. Sean Gubbins asks, why was some land owned by local landowners common? and other parts of their land not common? Uh, well, huh, yes. Um, yeah, it, it, well, they, they, um, the, the history of, of that is that, that um, there were broadly, I mean, broadly speaking, there, were, there was domain land, which was the sole property of the proprietor, the lord of the manor, and then there was beyond that, there was common, there was common land, which, as I said, the Lord of the Manor owned soil, but not the rights to exploit the, um, to exploit the, the soil. So not the right to graze cattle. Gra cattle grazing was the, was the classic one. Um, and um, so, so that was, that was the difference. Um, and domain land, I, I'm not a medieval historian, but I, I, I think domain land was, and there may be, there are probably people on this um, um, meet, uh, this this Zoom, this meeting that would be able to correct this, but I'm pretty sure that um, uh, from mid Middle Ages onwards, domain land was relatively restricted and the common, the land that was available as common was much, much larger. Um, and places like Epping Forest were, the whole of the forest was common land. Okay. Thank you. Um, a comment from Lufish 100. Before Corona, the Corporation of London proposed a series of 50,000 capacity festivals on Wanstead Flats. 
They did indeed. Local opinion was divided. It was. And is. <laughs> but they, no, the question was not determined as yet? No, I, no. It, well, because of, because of uh, well, the, 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 the first proposal was um, deferred. Um, and, um, but I think the, the proposal is still on the table, as it were. Um, it's it's a it's a very tricky one, and it's it's um, uh, th there's a quite a there's quite a substantial local campaign that um, is concerned about the environmental damage to um, wildlife on on Wanstead Flats, um, and uh, so so but the question remains open. I mean, basically, the reason why the City of London wants to do it is because um, they are, uh, well, Epping Forest is now a separately registered charity funded by the City of London and the City of London's funding, there's, there's a shortfall basically, and that, that is what the Epping Forest management is trying to make up. So I'm not going to divulge my sort of view on this. Um, I have an opinion on, on this, this matter, but uh, perhaps I'll leave it for another day. Okay, um, another question from Lufish100. By what process did the grounds of the former Wanstead House become common land? Um, well, they actually, the grounds of Wanstead House didn't become common land technically. Uh, Wanstead House, for those um, who don't know, sort of, it was on the fringes of, of Wanstead itself and um, was a huge, I mean, in the 18th century, it was built in the 18th century, it was an enormous um, house and very grand. Um, uh, the story of how uh, it fell to rack and ruin is a sad tale of a, of a marriage that uh, should never have happened. The richest heiress in, in England, um, Catherine Tilney Long, married a ne'er-do-well who spent all the money in 10 years. Once the house was, was demolished to, um, in the 1820s and the estate was a large part of the estate was sold off, but some of it was retained in trust. And actually, the City of London eventually bought it from the trustees um, of the estate in the late in the 1880s, um, and added it basically added it as a park to Epping Forest. So it never was actually common land um, as the rest of the forest was. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a it's a it's a sad tale for those who don't know it. It's a I shouldn't you're be laughing. You're absolutely right. It's yeah, a, a grand very sad house, tale. A grand um, house torn down. Grand house. But actually, I think the reason we have um, the southern part of Epping Forest today is probably because because of that um, uh, the collapse of the estate. Because I think if the family had lived on there they'd almost certainly have done what everybody else was doing by the end of the 19th century and sold it off for building land. So the fact that it actually was a, there was a 60 year hiatus in the middle of the 19th century where, where Wanstead Park really fell into disrepair, but remained in the trust of the family, um, probably saved it from development. Okay, interesting point. Can I fire some more at you? Mm, yeah. Um, this is from Hackney Glynn. Was there conflict between commoners and people using the commons for leisure? Uh, for example, about around cattle. I suppose that's people grazing cattle and people using it for leisure. Yeah, there were, there were there, yes, there was actually. And um, it's quite common across London that this, this happened, that, that traditional commoners, people who, who turned out cattle or horses are on um, common land like Epping Forest, um, they were as as annoyed as, as the lords of the manor by uh, the hoi polloi turning up from London, and actually that is that continued. the The cows remained on Wanstead Flats. The cattle remained commoners' cattle remained on Wanstead Flats until the 1990s, and there were constant conflicts between um, the farmers and, particularly, footballers took great exception to cows on Wanstead Flats. <laughs> for reasons that probably you could imagine. Um, and um, 
I never took a photograph. There was one a wonderful occasion where cows wandered across a football pitch in the middle of a match and the referee and the two teams were herding them away and I didn't take a photo. I always regretted that. But yes, there was a lot of tension uh, between the two. I suppose it might have made sliding tackles easier to... <laughs> yes, yeah, indeed. It certainly would. Um, here we are. This is um, a question about the green belt. I'll read it out. The green belt is the most obvious large-scale protected space under pressure from many city dwellers, but fiercely fought over by people who live nearby. Um, if the government ever relaxes green belt rules, do you envisage the same sort of reactions that you've been talking about in Victorian times? Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's interesting that that whenever there's um, uh, a, a threat to a, to in a locality, that a local campaign will, you know, will almost inevitably. Um, gather momentum, um, and I, I mentioned some of the more recent ones, um, uh, like the well, the not quite the same, but the ones did the, the demonstrations against the M11 Link Road, the, the campaign against that, which was a long well, as people on this this call will know, that there was a long campaign um, and sustained by the protesters. Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think if, if we could trust planners, you know, there, there are probably areas of the, of the green belt which are degraded today, um, which actually, you know, maybe could be used for, for um, housing. But, you know, absolutely no confidence at all that developers would, would honour any agreements that were made. Um, and I, you know, I think the green belt is a is a pretty precious resource. I mean, it's um, it it's sort of been pretty well maintained um, over the years, um, and I'm I'm sure that there would be, you know, there would be huge campaigns against um, any attempt to develop it. Okay, and uh, uh, another another one from David Pollock. Um, do you know if the current the fifth Baron Amherst still has some local land under his ownership? Uh, <clears throat> I don't. Actually, no, I don't. Um, no, because I, I, well, as far as I know, um, the Amherst family, well, they certainly sold off their manorial rights, which means that they basically sold the, the, la the land that they considered to be theirs, but, but was common land in Hackney. Um, but I could imagine that it's possible that they do still retain land. And I, I, given that there are, there's an Amherst Road and a, there are Tyson Road, I'm sure there's probably a Tyson Road in, in Hackney, maybe the family had, you know, property there that they, um, they hang on to. Um, but I'm afraid I don't know, that's speculation. Shouldn't okay. speculate. Maybe, maybe there are somebody, some people out there on the- I'm on sure the somebody on there. On the call, no, yeah. Now I've got I've got another question, um, which might be it might be rhetorical in light of um, in light of what you've been saying up to now, but I think I can twist it round at the end. Um, this is from a Mr. Elks. Oh. Do you think there's still a role for activism in protecting our open spaces today? And I would add to that, if it were if it were to come to it, do you think it would be more a uh, um, a common, per, a common people driven activism or would it be more a middle class or would we get a, a happy marriage between the two? Uh, yeah, well, um, yeah, I mean, that, this, this issue sort of came up throughout my research and uh, because, um, well, because, because in, the, in the period I was looking at, mid-Victorian period, all the records really come from middle class sources or newspapers. Um, and so it's a lens through which you're looking at um, uh, what ordinary people thought and did uh, about open spaces. Um, today, that would be a bit different, but I, I, I expect, you know, um, 
I imagine that campaigns will probably be led, led by the sort of small group of activists who have the time and energy to be involved. Um, but I, you know, I think we should never underestimate, well, two things. One, the attachment that just ordinary people, all sorts of ordinary people have to their local open spaces, um, which is often not spoken, but is there. And secondly, that they themselves actually, it's not just about sort of break one, well, the 19th century breaking fences and, um, and, and demonstrating. It's also through all kinds of other act, act, actions like through the, the political process that ordinary people were involved. And I, I could, I'm, you know, I'm absolutely sure the, the campaign for against the uh, against the briefing center, the police briefing center for the Olympics, on Wanted Flats was complete. It, it was a hugely diverse campaign. The meetings, the meetings were quite tumultuous. It has to be said, and um, quite tricky for the City of London and the Met to deal with, um, because they they and they involved everybody. You know, they involved a whole raft of local people. Um, Likewise, as far as I, I'm aware, with the MLM Link Road, for example, I think there was a very wide diversity of people involved in that. So, yeah, I mean, it's sort of the finger is always pointed. It was, it's always kind of, you know, the uh, um, middle class gentrifiers who are the ones who don't want, you know, who don't want development on their doorstep. But I think, I think, you know, as, as was was demonstrated, sort of, has been demonstrated over and over again. Um, many different people with many different motivations, and ordinary, you know, working class people get involved too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, oh, another another comment. This is from Hackney Glynn, who we heard from before. Thanks, Mark. There's a great video from the 1970s of cows on Wanstead and excited school kids <laughs> trying to find it, but it's out there somewhere, maybe yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. And a there comment from, from Rosie Barker. Um, she's appreciated very much your detailed research and knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just, yes, thank you very much. Thanks for those kind words. I, I the, um, yes, the, cow, the cows, I'm collecting cow photographs from um, uh, anything that involves a cow in a road or eating hedges and that's but because the cows of Wanstead were they were famous they got they used to they used to get on the news because in the morning back in the day there, there would be sort of um, traffic reports and people would say the cows of Wanstead are out again you know blocking the whatever road it is um, cows were they would regularly wander down um, off the flats, they wander a couple of miles away. And West Ham Park, for those who, who don't know, West Ham Park is probably probably a couple of miles from Wanstead Flats. Cows used to get in there in the morning, and um, and they had to be rounded up and put in the tennis courts by the uh, by the parkies in Wanstead Park, uh, in West Ham Park, um, before the the cattle man from the flats could come down on his little moped and drive them back up through the streets, back onto the flats. And that went on until, well, 1996 was the last year that they were on the flats. Um, yes, I, I remember, I remember the, the, the cows and um, I remember the cattle grids on, on, on the approaches to Whips Cross Roundabout. Are they, yeah. are they still there on the road? No, they've taken, well, there's one left. There's, there's one um, uh, at the Green Man Roundabout, um, uh, which comes uh, the, coming up from the Link Road. Um, and that's the that's the last one left. Um, I, there are one or two ghost signs. There's a, a cattle. There's a, a, a sort of a cow sign at the end of our road here um, <laughs> on the edge of Forest Gate, uh, which um, I hadn't noticed until the other day. Um, so maybe they'll they'll be. Well, of course they are. These the um, Epping Forest Management did in, reintroduce three cows back to Wanstead Park last summer, the late summer of last year. And they, that was very successful. So they're going to do it again this year. So it you know, maybe we'll see the cows back on once it flats. Okay. But okay. do come and see the cows in 
it'll they'll be out in September this year on in Wanstead Park. Thinking of ghost cow signs, I think people of a certain age might be reminded, like me, of the old cowboy song, Ghost Riders in the Sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yes, I mean, they, it was, they were great, actually. I, they, and what, what was great about them is they didn't care, you know. They were disrupting traffic, they didn't care. Um, and in, in fact, you know, they would, there'd be standoffs with, with the drivers because the cows would just, if a driver tried to drive through them, the cows would just stop in the road. So, um, yeah, they were a good antidote to traffic. <laughs> Very good. Traffic calming. Yeah, they certainly were. Um, now then, um, that's the end of my list of questions, but um, just if anybody's burning to ask one and they're, they're, they're logging on to YouTube and adding to the chat, um, and asking questions that way. Let's give them a minute or two, and I can um, um, I can just just mention again what we've been talking about before. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, Mark. Your book is um, Saving the People's Forest. It's a University of Hertfordshire. That's the current right, yeah, that we have. Yeah, that's it. And we'll be sending details out about that to the people who've registered for the talk. Um, the Hackney Society's new book uh, should be available from next week, and that's Women from Hackney's History. And there is a talk about that on the 25th of March um, with Sue Doe and Lucy Madison, who will be talking about some of the women from Hackney's history and taking us on a, a virtual walk to some of the places that are linked to these women. Um, I don't have any more questions that have come in, so I think we can... Yeah, that was the last one. Um, Mark, thank you. Many, many, many thank, thank yous to you for, for your talk. Um, extremely interesting, as, the, as some of the um, viewers have been saying, um, obviously very well researched. And uh, there's a lot more um, detail and facts in your book, I would imagine. Well, there sure, yes, there sure is, <laughs> if you've got an appetite for it. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's very good to be here. Well, thanks, 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 thanks once again for your talk, um, and uh, thanks everybody else for for, um, for coming up to watch. Um, and uh, we look forward to our next talk on the twenty fifth of March. And um, meanwhile, we'll we'll give you some more of this information on the screen as as we're all leaving and winding down. Um, thanks once again, Mark, and good night to you. Thank you.